Being Black in America comes with its challenges. However, we understand that enlightenment through education is the oppressor's worst fear. By bridging the gap between academia and the people, our purpose is to equip you with knowledge that breaks down barriers during your journey towards truth and freedom. Welcome to the Black and Highly Dangerous Podcast. Yo, 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 Dad, what's up? Nothing much. What's up with you, Ty? Nothing, you, going you know, on? nothing much, you know, still on high uh, from Black Panther. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, me too, on a high from Black Panther. Um, also, I'm like in travel mode right now, uh, mm-hmm. coming from Miami, heading up to Cambridge, about to handle some business. Um, mm. So, yeah, still on the uh, high of Black Panther, but also on the business mode. Yeah, yeah. Got to got to get busy, you know, until <laughs> yeah. uh, Wakanda becomes a reality. We still got to keep working, I guess. Yeah. I mean, because, you know, part of the business is figuring out how can we create Wakanda in America, kind of like we said in a, uh, the last conversation. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it, it actually makes me think about today's conversation because, you know, last week we demonstrated our global economic power because it wasn't just black people in America. You know, it was black people in South Africa, black people in West Africa, black people all over. Mm-hmm. And so we demonstrated our global economic power. And so for me, kind of like how we ended the conversation, I'm really interested in figuring out how we can channel the economic power um, to better help ourselves because we have the money. Uh, we just got to spend it right. Yeah, yeah. I, and we see that we can spend money. I think that has been a major trend within the black community. Our dollar is always powerful. And many people, many companies, products, whatever, are always competing to get the black dollar. Mm-hmm. And I think it felt good when we seen Black Panther because we were able to use the black dollar on a product that represented us and our culture and our struggles and our stories and our narratives. So I think the next part of that conversation is how can we use our dollar and our power and our economic power overall to continue what we've seen happen with, you know, Black Panther. Um, and I think that's, you know, an important conversation to be had. And then also, you know, um, the guest that we have on today, his name is Ash Cash, and he's written a book on a, a album that many of you probably have heard of, uh, 444 mm. by Jay-Z. <laughs> um, and in this book, and, and well, the title of his book is uh, The Wake Up Call, Financial Inspiration, Learn from 444. And so in this book, he really breaks down many of the principles that Jay-Z highlighted in his album about how we should attain financial freedom as a community, some of those perspectives, some of those steps. And he's a financial advisor, been in the game for over 15 years Mm -hmm. um, and has a very, very well established resume. And we'll talk about that during the interview. But I think it's a pretty cool way to take, again, a product that was created for the community. And then now people like financial advisors, academics are using that to expand the conversation of how we can practically continue this run and continue to empower our communities. Uh, Agree. Mm -hmm. And I'll have to say, um, it's not because I read a lot. It's not very often that I am learn. I learn new things, but I would say this book definitely did it for the culture um, Mm -hmm. and provided some very useful tips and strategies uh, for Mm -hmm. managing money and like building it. So really excited to get into this conversation and, you know, kind of, you know, understand a little bit more about his, you know, inspiration and um, Mm -hmm. just more about, you know, him and like his vision for, you know, what we can do moving forward. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, I think it's compelling in the fact that he did use a popular item like the album uh, 444. And so, no, we're not really going to talk about him and his issues marriage issues with yes, Beyonce no, no. <laughs> that's not gonna be we're gonna talk about how included. they built the empire empire if anything yeah. yes we're gonna talk about how they got that billion dollars in the elevator that's yes what we're gonna be billion about. dollars in the elevator <laughs> yep yep that's what I'm trying to talk um, about and and infidel- 
infidelity, but the fight in the elevator will not be a topic of discussion as well. It will not. Uh, it will not. Just, just to let you all know as far as what to expect for this conversation. But we're excited to have Ash Cash on today. We think it's a much needed conversation of, okay, we understand that we need to have uh, you know, more economic power and mobility in, in our community. And he offers some really, really good advice from individual level of what we can do practically, just, you know, how to save, what to save, how to get an income. And then for the more systemic issue, just looking at trends within the black community and what we do differently that may be holding us back compared to other groups of folk in our nation and around the world. So we're excited to have Ash Cash on. We hope you get a lot from this and, uh, you know, Continue to make dash money. Yeah, yeah, dash money. <laughs> All right. Well, let's get into it. All right, this. see you in a bit. Right. Yep. We just demonstrated our economic power by the record breaking performance and support of Black Panther. Now we need to channel that power. And to help us understand how to do that will be the topic of today's conversation with today's guest, Ash Cash. Ash Cash is a 15-year banking executive, personal finance expert, and a motivational speaker. Also, he's the author of two Amazon.com best-selling books, Mind Right, Money Right, 10 Laws of Financial Freedom, and What the FICO, 12 Steps of Repairing Your Credit. Today, we'll be discussing his new book and also Amazon.com best-selling, The Wake Up Call, Financial Inspiration Learned from Jay-Z's 444, plus a step-by-step guide on how to implement each principle. He is also a business consultant, spiritual advisor to entrepreneurs, celebrities, athletes, and executives. Ash Cash is also a part of the Leadership Council member of World Money Financial Institute, which is a nonprofit whose mission is to empower youth with an immersive financial and technology education, creating financially responsible adults one child at a time. He is also a regular speaker at national conferences across the country. He's been on feature to some of the most popular media outlets, such as CNN, the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, American Banker, CNBC, TheStreet.com, Black Enterprise, Essence Magazine, Ebony, BET, Pix11 Morning News, just to name a few. Additionally, he's the host of his own radio show titled The Ash Cash Show, which airs live on WHCR 90.3 FM NY with a current reach of 2.2 million listeners. And his podcast can also be found on iTunes, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Stitcher, and on the TuneIn app. Today, we welcome Ash Cash. So Ty gave a really great introduction. You clearly know what you're doing. Um, and so what kind of to get into this interview, I wanted a little bit uh, wanted to know a little bit more about why you decided to take this path. What compelled you um, to write this book and, and your other books? Um, and what's your ultimate goal for um you know, writing uh, the 444 uh, financial advice book. No, absolutely. Thank you for the question. Um, you know, honestly, I'm just I'm just a kid from Harlem. I, I grew up in Harlem, NYC. I'm from the projects. I'm from St. Nicholas Houses, 129th Street, 8th Avenue. Uh, and I grew up, uh, you know, typical, you know, inner city story. I grew up uh, to a single parent, you know, in a single parent household. Uh, my mom raised myself, my, my brother and my sister, um, because my uh, mother was a Haitian immigrant. Uh, she didn't really have a good command of the, uh, you know, English language. So she could only work factory jobs. Um, and so, you know, she didn't really bring, um, you know, uh, as much money as was, as was needed to, you know, raise a, a household. Um, and so I've been an entrepreneur practically all my life. I started out uh, eight years old. Uh, packing bags at the local supermarket uh, at 12 years old, I, you know, sort of like graduated and was selling mixtapes and CDs and, and you know, shirts, uh, you know, on 125th Street when, when that was uh, was a thing, when we had all the vendors outside. Um, and so I've always, you know, understood the importance of, um, you know, entrepreneurship, owning your own and uh, not really finding excuses, you know, because um, in, in my neighborhood, you, you know, you think about the inner city, uh, I've seen everything that that comes with it. Um, I've partaked in, a, in, in some things that um, my adult self may not necessarily be proud of, uh, you know, did, you know, got in trouble a lot, kicked out of school, like, you know, anything that you you can imagine, you know, I was a part of that environment. Um, and but for me, 
um, the, the the turning point or the pivot happened um, around the time where, you know, you get old enough where, you know, the girls are, are starting to pay attention to you and you start to notice that the, that the guys that the girls are paying attention to are the ones that they got the fly clothes or whatever the case may be. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and so now I'm like, uh, now I got to start making more money and, you know, I have to make a choice, right? I have to decide, am I going to, am I going to take the route that all my friends are taking, which is, uh, you know, the, the street life or, uh, am I going to find a, a different way to, you know, to, uh, you know, make ends meet or, or, or thrive? Um, and, you know, I, I call it luck. I call it my mama, my mama praying. I call it God. The universe, you know, had a different, you know, wanted to take me in a different direction. And so, you know, I wind up um, and, and I literally remember this this uh, this incident where um, a friend of mine was, was, you know, selling drugs in the projects. Uh, he was making a lot of money. Um, to the point where he had, you know, SUVs, we were like 17, 18 and he had like, you know, these cars, clothes. I was like, that's what I want. He was getting all the girls. I'm like, that's what I want. Um, and I was, I was in the process of sort of like jumping in and and taking that route. Uh, and my sister and I were really, really close. Um, me and my sister actually had an argument, uh, because I told her of my plans. Um, and she, you know, we were arguing, we almost, you know, got into a, you know, physical fight. Uh, because she was just, you know, telling me how stupid it was. Um, and so the, co- the consensus was, you know, if I can get you a job, will you not, you know, take this route? And I say, hey, if you can give me a job, then let's do it. And, and so I wound up uh, getting a job at a, a video store. Um, and, you know, I, I started making some money. So that stopped me from, you know, dealing in the streets. Um, and, and while I was working at the video store, uh, you know, like two years later, uh, one of the assistant managers came in and said, hey, Chase Bank is hiring for tellers. Uh, and I said, you know, I knew I knew that that there was but so high I can go at the video store where I was working. And so I say, all right, let me just you know, let me might as well just, you know, take this position at the, you know, or apply for the position as a teller, um, you know, you know, applied for it, uh, became a teller and the rest is history. I was 19 years old uh, when I started my position at Chase Bank. Um, I've done everything in banking. Uh, from teller, personal banker, private banker. I was a VP at 24 years old. Um, I, I've done everything, you know, in, in my career in banking. Uh, mm-hmm. And I realized, you know, two things I realized is one, uh, the difference between rich and wealth and, you know, and poor is really mindset. Um, hence why I wrote my first book, Mind Right, Money Right, um, because it was really about um, now that I that I understood both sides of the coin, you know, I grew up low income, uh, but then now I'm a banker. I have access to millionaires. I have access to people who uh, have true financial freedom. Uh, and so I started to understand how money worked. Uh, and I went back and I said, man, you know, they don't teach us this in our community. They're not talking to us about, you know, how money really works, not how we, we perceive it to work, not what our parents tell us how it works. But there's a true way that money works. Um, and so, you know, if, if I could if I could quote Jay-Z uh, for a second, he says uh, there mu- there's much bigger issues in the world. I know. But I first had to take care of what he's pretty much saying is there's other issues out there that he could tackle, but he wants to focus on the world that he's familiar with. Um, And that was the reason why I got into this this business or uh, this work um, of financial education uh, was because uh, there's much bigger issues in the world. But I understand, um, you know, my people, I understand uh, people who grew grow up with adversity, uh, people who they count out, people who they say would never be anything. And I understand that if you just shift your mindset, uh, then you can you can achieve anything that you want out of life. And that's my life mission uh, is, is to relay that message. And, and that's you know, that's how I started uh, in the business of financial education and, uh, you know, teaching the community about how to uh, bec- truly become financially free. Mm. So it's interesting because from your experience, right, um, and, and your book is great because you also have a lot of practical advice, but what I also appreciate about it is you have a lot of context of as far as why this is important, especially when it comes to the black community. So from your experience, um, from your knowledge, what do you say are some of the biggest issues we have as a community when it comes to our finances and trying to build wealth? Mm, I think I think that the biggest uh, issue um, collectively as a community is ownership, honestly, is that we don't take uh, we don't take as serious ownership um, as we should, because, you know, one of one of the things that's that's really alarming is that when you think about the the black and brown community, uh, the biggest employer of that community is the government. Right. So state, city, federal. Um, and so we're, we're at the mercy of government. 
Um, and so, you know, the second highest employer of black and brown people in America is black and brown businesses. Um, and so we need to first understand the importance um, of ownership first and foremost, right? Because if we don't have that as a goal of ours, if we don't have that as a, a reason um, for us to make money, it's not, you know, it's not to make money to acquire things, but it's, you know, it should be about making money so we can own things that we can pass down uh, and build our financial freedom. I think that's the biggest issue is that we don't understand ownership. The second biggest issue is, you know, what I alluded to in, in, in the end of that answer uh, is that we don't we make money um, again as a community. We're able to make money, um, but we spend it on we spend it on things. Right. We spend it on, uh, you know, buying a nice house, uh, the car, the clothes uh, going out. And we don't spend as much money as we need to on, you know, buying, appreciating assets, buying things uh, that are going to create multiple streams of income. Um, and, and it's a mindset. So right now, like people might be listening and, and it might it, we have we weren't taught this. Right. We weren't taught uh, about, you know, buying, appreciating assets, about residual income, about ownership. Um, and, and, and this is practical. This is I'm talking I'm not talking you know, you know, from an esoteric perspective where, uh, you know, high level, you know, you need to be a multimillionaire. I'm talking about, you know, your first home, you know, take out take out a loan. But instead of buying your first home to live in, you know, buy your first home and, and, and rent it out, you know, become a landlord first and then use the money that you're making, you know, from from renting out your, your place uh, to now subsidize your living, things of that nature. Um, and I think that, that that's the second thing that, that we don't really do. Uh, as we don't really, um, you know, change the relationship with our money. We don't really, you know, we're, we're taught that we need to work for money. Um, but what we need to be doing uh, is making money work for us. And I think that, uh, you know, we get satisfied uh, with, you know, with with making money or whether it's on a nine to five, whether it's a business, uh, we get satisfied with just making the money based on off of our physical labor um, and not learning how to, uh, you know, make money work for us so that we don't necessarily have to rely solely on our physical labor. No. Uh, yeah, I, I definitely uh, agree with you. I think one of the things that kind of stood out to me um, in your book when you talked about uh, the power of the black dollar. So we have the ability to make money. We make plenty of money. Uh, but when you talk about the lifespan of our dollars and how, you know, um, the Asian community is 28 days. The Jewish community is 19 days. And the black community is six days. I mean, six, six hours. hours. I was six, right, hours. six hours. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> Wow, that's um, crazy. And how, you know, that speaks to like our need to create our own businesses so that we can recycle our dollars, but also just to get out of like, I guess, the consumer, the consumer mindset. Um, yeah. And, and, and even to piggyback off that, right, another gem you had dropped was I think a part of that issue is that you said that African-Americans spend approximately 93 percent of their annual disposable income with people who live outside of their neighborhood and the communities. So, again, kind of going along with Daphne was saying, this really illustrates the urgency of that. We have money. We have, you know, consumer dollars, et cetera. But we tend to spend it more on others than on ourselves um, and how that can contribute to our overall issues as well financially as a community. No, absolutely. And, I, and I, you know, I think I think part of it um, is because we were never taught that that our money is our power. You know, um, we were taught like even if you think about civil rights era, right, you think about, you know, the, the, the Montgomery, bo uh, you know, bus boycott um, on the surface. You, you know, you would look and you would think that it was the boycotting that did it. Like on the surface, you know, the message that that's being portrayed was that, oh, if we stick together, if we march, if we, we let our voices be heard, then, you know, demands could be met. That's absolutely false, because even throughout the, the, the protests and the boycott, no one listened. It was after, uh, you know, it was it, not, not the boycott, but the protest and the marching. But it, it was the boycott that did it. It was actually, you know, after it was a year and people don't even understand that. So for one year, black folks stood, stood together and said, you know what? I don't care how long it's going to take me to get to work. I'm going to get up earlier. I'm going to walk to work. 
Right. I'm not going to use this bus system because, you know, the the fact that they make us, you know, sit on the back of the bus, we're not going to do it anymore. Right. And so for one year, there was this unity and said, I'm not spending my dollar with those who don't respect me and respect my money. And what happens after that? They, you know, they, we started to affect their pockets, right? And the bus company was like, wait, hey, you know, no, nah, that's this, we can't, this can't happen, right? We can't allow, you know, our dollars to be affected. So let's give them what they want. Um, and so that is the, that is the point when people think about, um, their dollar, we're not being taught that our dollar is our power. Um, and you know, like I didn't watch the Super Bowl. I'm not somebody who, I don't pass judgment on what other people do. Um, but if, you know, collectively, you know, the fact that there are 70 percent of the players in the NFL, you know, are black and brown people. And, you know, Colin, you know, Colin Kaepernick is being condemned for just taking a nonviolent knee, uh, you know, to, to to talk about, you know, police brutality and things that are happening in the country. Um, and we're not being respected. I think that it would have showed, uh, you know, a, a sense of, uh, you know, solidarity. And, they, and, and we, we would have been taken more seriously, you know, had we not participated uh, in, in, you know, in the NFL. And so there's just so many different examples of how we could, you know, affect change by first taking, take, you know, taking control of that dollar, um, you know, politically, if, you know, if, if we, you know, understood that those who get things done are those who put their money behind politicians. Uh, I think if we, you know, we, we, we think our vote is, is, is enough, right? But we don't understand that it's, it's the money. Are you, are you funding these campaigns? Are you helping, you know, you know, get the people that you want elected into office? And so, you know, j- just, just the simple fact that if we were our own country, we would be the 15th richest country in the world. Right. If we were our own country, if you took us out of the American, uh, you know, ecosystem and we decided to create our own nation based on the money that we spend, we would be the 15th uh, richest country in the world. And so that tells you that we have the power. And now is the time for us to recognize that power and use it effectively to, you know, get what we want out of our communities, out of, out of our lives, out of our politicians, out of, out of businesses. Uh, it's important that we understand that, that our money is our power. I was about to say, um, all of that, it takes a lot of discipline um, in self-control. So even thinking about um, your Super Bowl example and how you said you did not watch it. Um, and I know some people that did not watch it, you know, off principle, but it was one of those things where even if they hadn't, a lot of people, even if they hadn't been watching all year, you know, they tuned into the Super Bowl. And again, no judgment. But, you know, I think about the fact that right after the election, you know, there was a lot of activity around like financial boycotts. And there was like this Google Doc that listed all all these companies, you know, that had connections to certain politicians, you know, it went on for a while and there was a lot of passion behind it for a while, but it kind of died out. And I think what you just spe- uh, said speaks to the importance of like continuing, you know, to push for those things and, and staying disciplined uh, in, in, you know, your principled um, opposition to certain types of things, oh, no, especially I, when it comes to money. Absolutely. And, and it also, you know, de- Definitely. It it takes, you know, it takes discipline. Um, It also takes, um, you know, one voice, you know, a conservative effort uh, for us to understand and and identify, uh, you know, those who are in support of, you know, our community and those who aren't. Um, You know, I am definitely a proponent of, uh, you know, the buy black movement movement. And, uh, you know, I think that it's important. Um, but I, it's also important to, um, you know, support businesses that may not be black owned, but are, you know, supporting the community. You know, um, you know, I live in, in lower Westchester County in, in New York. Um, and, you know, I know that every time I go into a Target, um, the, the people that are that are that are employed are majority, you know, black and brown people, young people. And I love to, to walk into that store uh, because they are supporting, our, you know, our young people. Uh, and, you know, from looking at some of the things that they've done and, and, and you know, things that they do around the community, uh, it's some place that I, I, I feel great about spending my money. Um, it's, you know, you know, not black owned, but they support the black community. And so, you know, I, I really think that. 
um, to that point is that it's not necessarily only, you know, focusing on, you know, black businesses. It's also focusing on black businesses and those businesses that support the black community. Because, in fact, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, Maggie Anderson, uh, who wrote the book Our Year Black, uh, where she started an experiment of just shopping uh, in black only stores for one year, her and her family, um, she partnered up with the Kellogg, Kellogg University Institute. Um, and they showed that in, in order to create a million more jobs in the black community, it doesn't even take all of you doesn't take 100 percent participation uh, in uh, you know, black owned businesses, all it takes is if an increase, right? If you took middle, middle, uh, income black folks and they increased their, their consumption of black businesses and businesses that support the black community, uh, just 7% more, right? Cause the, you know, cur- currently it's only, you know, 3%. So 7% more to 10%. You would you would you would automatically, you know, see an, an, an in- increase of about a million jobs. And so, you know, it's it's about being intentional. It's about having one voice. It's about, you know, those who have the microphone, which is one of the reasons why I was so excited to, to put this book together. Uh, the wake up call, you know, financial lessons learned from 444. Is because someone like Jay Z has the microphone. People listen to him. He's influential, and so when he tells you that you know getting your credit right is better than you know than, than spending money in a strip club, when he's telling you that financial freedom is our only hope, when he's talking about generational wealth, wills, estates, things that we are not necessarily taught, um, you know, I just felt like an obligation to you know continue to push that that message forward, um, and and so we have to realize that it's going to take you know, those who have the microphone to continue to amplify their voice, voices, those who are, you know, on the ground level to continue to push the message forward um, and just, you know, one, one sound, you know, one sound and one message. Um, and, and, and eventually we'll we'll start to, to see changes that, that, that we need to see in our communities. Okay. I have one more question before we uh, start getting to a little bit of some of the, the practical gems you offer in the book. Um, and you had mentioned gentrification at one point in the book. Um, and I think the line, I think I have it right here, says, you know, uh, instead of creating and maintaining our own tables, we were satisfied with the seat at someone else's table. And for many, we still fight to maintain that seat. And this is why many of our black inner city communities are now being regentrified because we didn't appreciate what we had when we had it. And I definitely um, agree to an extent with that particular the point. And it's only a sentence, so I'm not going to harp on it too much. But I also, I think a trend that I've been seeing within our communities, um, especially in places like Newark and places like Brooklyn as well, I feel like an unintended consequence of the community members actually beginning to care about their communities, driving down crime rates, fixing them up, has made it attractive for people to come from the outside, right? And now, without those certain protections in place, where in terms of real estate, et cetera, um, it's beginning to push out, you know, the people, the the native people of these communities. But I think it's also happening because they actually, in fact, do and did care about their communities, fixed it up, and now we have people coming from the outside moving in. So how much of that do you think weighs into the gentrification process? Is it just we really didn't care or can it be also that we do care and it's just something that we don't have protections against for people when they do actually change their communities? No, absolutely. I think I think it's I think it's a combination of both. I think it's okay. a combination of, um, you know, a, a certain part of our, you know, our, our community, our population uh, that that just doesn't care. Um, you know, they are not invested in their community. They, it's the mindset, right? Their mindset, uh, is, is not, is not that of building their community up. Um, and I do think that there is, um, another aspect of it. I do, I do think that there are people who do care. Um, and I think that, that the, the, the folks who, uh, do care, but may not have the proper resources. Like I'll give you an example. Um, I remember a, um, someone who, uh, in Best Eye Brooklyn, a family friend, who was, you know, had, uh, you know, uh, you know, a home uh, in their community uh, passed down from generation to generation. Um, and as property value of this home started to increase, uh, they weren't taught um, or they didn't know about, uh, you know, property tax. And so as the property value started to go up, the property tax started to go up. And so now they couldn't afford to keep the house. And so this is something that they wanted to, to do. They wanted to keep it. Um, but because they didn't have the proper resources um, or the proper, you know, you know, money um, to to pay property taxes, they 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 were forced to sell. Um, and, and, and that was, you know, that that was a, another thing that took, 
you know, wealth out of the community. And that's an mm-hmm. issue that we need to, to keep in mind, because even with gentrification, as you know, other uh, other ethnicity, uh, ethnicities, businesses uh, want to come into our community. Uh, what that does is it raises the property value, um, you know, you know, the market value in that community. And that might not necessarily mm-hmm. be a good thing because those who who, you know, you think about the old lady who has a fixed income. She doesn't you know, she's she's 70, she's 80 years old. She's retired. She has a fixed income. She can't necessarily start to pay you know, a thousand dollars, two thousand dollars a month in property taxes as her property goes up. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we need to, to keep things, things like that in mind. Um, and so I do think that there's a, it's a combination of, of those who, who don't care and, and also those who do care, but not, not necessarily having, um, sort of like the proper, proper resources. Um, but, I, but I do, I do think that, you know, as we start to, um, understand, uh, the importance of, you know, you know, taking care of, of, of where we are, taking care of our community, because I think that as, you know, as we build up our own communities, you, you know, um, and, and build up the stores and build up all these different things in our community, um, we don't necessarily need, you know, major department stores to come in or, or, you know, you know, major businesses to come in to, uh, inflate the prices of our, of our neighborhood and, and, and essentially price, price us out. Because as we now can't, we start, start not being able to afford them, you know, the, the next step is for us to move to a different different neighborhood uh, while while other people sort of move into those neighborhoods. So it's a, a combination of, you know, just understanding the, the, the dynamics of the neighborhood and how we could take, you know, full control of that. Um, absolutely. I, I actually know of someone personally, uh, the family could not afford to keep up with the taxes after um, the property value started to rise. And I thought that was one of the, um, the saddest things I've, I've ever heard. Um, yeah, so we have to figure out a solution to that. Um, we, we do want to like switch to some practical advice, uh, for people. Um, because you offer quite a bit. I mean, I even took some gems away and like I, I put them into action immediately after reading the book, nice. uh, Monday right. night. Um, um, but before we begin, um, with practical advice. Um, can you tell us or, or do you have a personal experience that, uh, resonates with you, uh, in regard to, uh, dealing with finances? Like, is there a mistake that you've made in the past that taught you a major, uh, lesson about managing money? Oh, absolutely. Um, I, you know, the biggest mistake, you know, to this date that I, that I have made financially, um, you know, somebody who, grew, you know, grew up low income, uh, the moment I started to make a lot of money in banking, uh, I, I, I was one of those who would, you know, buy the Mercedes Benz and buy the nice clothes and, you know, spending a lot of money um, on things that I necessarily didn't need, need to spend money on. Uh, back in 2010, you know, I, I pivot. You know, I pivoted and 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 wanted to uh, leave the banking world, and you know, started my you know my business as a speaker, a, a author, uh, and so I decided uh, that I was going to leave a six figure job uh, to be an entrepreneur, uh, and you know, I started I started making good money. I had a lot of great contracts, you know, out the gate, um, doing what I love to do. Uh, but what I what I didn't anticipate was you know, how cyclical my business was where there were certain months in a year where I wasn't going to make as much money. Um, and so I didn't account for that. And because I didn't account for that, um, you know, I started to see, you know, my income go down. Uh, there was a unforeseen, um, you know, issue where uh, one of the funders of a major contract that I had pulled out um, and, and it was no fault of my own. It was no fault of anybody. It was just, just to, you know, the, the time that we were in, the, the foundation wasn't able to continue to uh, fund this program. Uh, and so what, what, what wind up happening is that, you know, I lost a majority of part of my income. And so I couldn't afford my home anymore. And so, you know, my wife and I, you know, are, are, are looking and we're struggling. We're figuring out like how, you know, how did this happen? It was based on the decision I made because I was making, you know, good money at, at the bank. But I thought that I was going to be able to do it as an entrepreneur. Um, and so we almost lost our home. You know, we almost lost our home. Uh, we had to go through a, a short sale uh, where we put the house up for sale. Um, you know, luckily, we weren't, you know, we weren't, we didn't have to sell it. Uh, you know, we were able to bounce back and, and keep the home. Um, but, but that, that, that almost going through foreclosure, going through, 
a short sale really taught me uh, the importance of having multiple streams of income, uh, not relying on your physical labor. Uh, and so the, the moment that we started to bounce back, the moment that we started to make uh, more money, uh, we decided that you know we would invest money in real estate, uh, invest money in things that were, would provide us residual income um, and so that we're not reliant on just one source of income. And that's the biggest thing that I would tell anybody. Uh, that's the biggest lesson that I've learned through my mistakes um, is that you cannot, under any circumstance, uh, rely just on one source of income. If you have a great paying job, then good. Use that money, say, say you know, live below your means, use some of that money that you're making from this you know, great paying job to start a business, to invest in a business, right? You might, you might not have the time to start your own business, but you may, ha you may know somebody who, you know, is a good business person and, you know, they, they may have this idea that they just need funding. So you become a silent partner and make money that way. But, uh, it is economic suicide is what I like to call it. Uh, if, if you only have one source of income. And so that's the biggest lesson. Um, you know, I talk about it in the book as well, but that's the biggest biggest lesson that I would tell anybody uh, is to make sure you're diversifying your funds so that you are not solely reliant on one source of income. Mm. No, that's great advice. And, and I will talk about passive income a little bit, um, but even just taking it a step back, because I think a lot of people in our audience as well who listen to us um, may be in situations even that you experience yourself um, who uh, may be in low income communities. Work, working multiple part time jobs, right? Um, just to make ends meet, pay bills. And they may hear something like this. Okay. You know, I know I got to save. I know I got a budget. How can I make extra income? But I barely have enough to kind of make ends meet. Now, what kind of advice would you give to that person to lay the foundation, right? Things such as saving, um, you know, I think one, one quote you had in the book is don't save what you have left after spending, save, uh, spend what you have left after saving. Um, and so it's like, how can we begin to give advice to people who are kind of in the financial crunch um, to begin to at least have the building blocks to save and budget, et cetera? Because sometimes in their eyes, they may be like, mm, this is this is just not possible for me right now. No, absolutely. I, and that's a great question. Um I think it's, it's, it's similar to like a cut, right? It's similar to like, um, you know, you know, walking, you know, walking barefoot, uh, you step on a nail, um, and now this nail is stuck in your foot, right? You have a few options. You can, you know, go to the pharmacy and, you know, take uh, a Tylenol, take a painkiller, right? To stop the pain. And anytime the pain comes, you keep taking that painkiller to stop the pain, right? Um, and that's the easiest way to do it, meaning that if somebody has pain going on, you find these temporary solutions to sort of like help you, uh, you know, create it from a temporary basis. But the fact of the matter is that if you never take that nail out and never heal that wound, uh, you're going to continuously be in pain and you're never, you know, going to, you know, uh, uh, enjoy life without that pain in your foot. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, and even after you take the, 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 the nail out, though, right, even after you take the nail out, there's a process of healing. Right. It's not just going to take the nail out and then you're not going to be in pain anymore. Yeah. There's actually still going to be pain when you take the nail out. You're actually going to have to, you know, clean out the wound. It's going to scab up a little bit. You might have to get stitches like that whole process of healing it. It is, is necessary because regardless whether you keep taking painkillers or you take the nail out, you're going to always feel pain. And you but but if you take the nail out and go through that process of cleaning it out to get in the stitches, you know, letting the scab up, take the scab off. But eventually, once it heals, it is healed and you don't have to worry about, you know, that pain ever again unless you step on a nail again. But this time you'll be more careful and, and make sure that you're not stepping on any nails. And so how do I relate this example that I just gave? If you are living paycheck to paycheck, if you're struggling right now, by not taking uh, action to become a saver, by not taking action to, you know, start paying yourself first, taking care of your, your debt, creating multiple streams of income, no matter what your, your situation is right now, without taking that action, all you're doing is taking a Tylenol. Right. All you're doing is creating, you know, you still have the pain and that pain is never going to go away unless you permanently remove that pain away. And so all you're doing is taking painkillers and you're never going to get out your situation. What needs to happen is that you need to pull that 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 nail out and pulling the nail out 
means that you are creating a system that you're paying yourself first because most people don't necessarily even know how much taxes are coming out of their their account. What they do know is what gets deposited into their bank account when it's payday. What they do know is what they get as a check if they don't have direct deposit and they budget based on that. And so I say, why should you pay your taxes and, and treat the IRS better than you treat yourself? Right. And so I need you to treat yourself like the IRS. So instead of, you know, budgeting based on, you know, what money's coming in, pay yourself first. Create this habit of, you know, you know, creating savings, putting, you know, you know, uh, 10 percent of your, your, your income away so that you build an emergency fund or build a financial freedom fund, like I like to call it. And that may be the process of healing, right? And it's not going to be easy in the beginning. And that's the point of, you know, after you take the nail out and you start to, you know, you get the stitches and that might, might hurt, uh, you know, it might scab up and that might hurt. Taking off the scab might hurt, right? So in your current situation, saving money, when you say, oh, I don't even have enough. Yeah, it might hurt in the beginning. It might, it might be tough. It might, you, you might have to cut out cable. You might not have, you, you might, you know, not have to go out as much. You might have to eat, you know, you know, not, you know, uh, spend money on lunch. You might have to, you know, make lunch at home. There might be some sacrifices that you make early on, but I guarantee you, and this is, I'm not, this is not speculation, uh, but I guarantee that if you start to take some of those necessary steps in the beginning, cutting back a little bit, I like to say, you know, act your wage, not your want size. There are a lot of things that we want and because we want them, we're spending all this money on it, but we need to act our wage. We need to live below our means. And as we live be below our means, we start to now have more money accumulated and we start making better decisions with our money. And eventually having that, that mindset of having money, that mindset of not struggling, not only um, a, from a practical perspective allows you um, to have that financial freedom, from a spiritual perspective too. You know, I'm a big believer of the law of attraction and where, where there's scarcity, you cannot build. And so if you're, think, if you're living paycheck to paycheck and everything is scarce, you're not allowing your brain, the universe, God, your higher power, the space to work for you because you're worried, right? But when you start to have money saved and you can look on your bank account and say, man, you know, I'm, I feel abundant today. I have this money. That's actually going to open more doors um, and that's going to allow, you know, more opportunities for, for money to come in. Um, you know, that's why the saying, you know, the rich get rich, the poor get poor is because you get what you focus on. If you're only focusing on lack, that's, you, that's what you're going to get. You're going to continue to get lack. But as you start to focus on abundance, you start to get more abundance. So, so it's, it's important that we are intentional about our abundance because once we are intentional about it, mm. more of that abundance will come. And, and, and again, uh, this is, I'm, this is not, I'm not speculating this. I know this for a fact. I am a product of St. Nicholas housing projects. Like I am not, I did not grow up in Parsippany, New Jersey, which I've never been to, but that just sounds like a nice place, right? <laughs> I'm not from there. I'm from the hood. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and this is me as somebody who at 24, you know, I was making a lot of money. And so I'm not, you know, somebody who is, you know, talking in theory, because I know a lot of times people hear these things and say, well, it's, it's easy for you to say you don't understand. And I'm telling you that I grew up low income and I was able to, you know, make some money. But then I lost it, though, too. Right. Because if you understand what I just said about 2010, you know, I was at a position where I was a, I'm a homeowner. I'm doing well. But then, every, the, you know, the, the, the wool was pulled under underneath as well. And I had to rebuild. And, and again, it's really about a mindset. It's, 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 it's sacrificing in the beginning for that long term, uh, you know, financial freedom. Thank you for that. Uh, speaking of abundance and speaking of uh, moving beyond theory, um, I really wanted you to uh, kind of go back to uh, your discussion of passive income um, and just have you talk a little bit more about that. And also, can you... Uh, I guess talk about some very specific um, opportunities that people um, can seek out, everyday people can seek out to build passive income so we can stop this payday loan trend. Mm, absolutely. Um, you know, you know, I, I talk about, um, you know, creating passive income because, you know, in, in, in Jay-Z's album, he talks about merrily, merrily eating off of streams. Um, and when we think about that, you know, you, you know, the, the, the listener, 
may immediately think that he's talking about just title streams because yo, know, right, it's you know, he owns a streaming company and they stream music. Oh yeah, so he's eating off the streams. But it's a double entendre, right? He's talking about merrily, merrily eating off of multiple streams of income. Um so when you think about someone like Jay-Z who has uh, you know, liquor uh, he has music, he has, you know, investment property, real estate, uh, you know, sports management, all these different businesses that are giving him, you know, uh, you know, uh, the ability uh, to create multiple streams of income. You know, it's it's important um, that we build that for ourselves as well. Uh, but we you know, we only have 24 hours in a day. So how can we do that? You know, how can we build multiple streams of income when we only have 24 hours in a day? And so that's why passive income is important, because passive income or residual income uh, just simply means uh, receiving income without physically having to put in labor. Right. And so, you know, for instance, I'm an author. Um, I've written six books. Um, and every time. You know, someone purchases one of my books. Uh, I get a I get a check at the end of the month, right? I wrote the book. I still have books that I've written uh, in 2009 that still sell to this day. Um, I did the work one time. I wrote the book, uh, but now each month I still get checks based on that book. Those are my my residual income. So those are like passive uh, passive income that I, that I that I use um, or that I have. Uh, and so I think that. Um, there are ways that for, for, for the everyday person um, that can create, they can create, um, you know, um, passive income for themselves. Uh, some examples, I just gave one example, uh, which was creating intellectual property. So whether it is uh, like, like, you know, if you're a writer, uh, you know, I've written, you know, again, I, I love to write, so I write books, uh, but that could be, you know, eBooks, it could be poetry, uh, you know, if you're a filmmaker, movies, just things that uh, you can create that's your and people, uh, you know, can, can, can purchase uh, that can give you, give, give you income. Um, I talked about, you know, home ownership, which a lot of people always think about home ownership um, as may, potentially a burden because of the expenses that may come with becoming a homeowner. Uh, but it, well, one example of doing that uh, is buying a, a multifamily home. And so instead of buying a, you know, a, a property that you are going to live in solely, you buy a multifamily home, you rent out one unit and you stay in the other unit. And that way, that's a source of residual income for you. That's a source of passive income um, for you. Uh, you can, you know, we're, we, we're connected to so many people now via social media. And so you can create a blog, a podcast, a video series that can go viral. Right. Or even if it doesn't go viral, just connecting with people who need to hear your message. There are advertisers out there that are willing to pay you uh, in order to get access to your, you know, to, to your audience. You know, for, even for me, you know, that's that's actually a source of income for me as well. So I have a radio show, uh, but within the radio show, there are brands that say, hey, you know, we want to we want to talk to your audience. And if if you know, if it's a brand that aligns with my message, uh, you know, I I will, uh, you know, accept sponsorship dollars or ad dollars to be able to promote their message. Um, so that's that's another way uh, you have online courses. You know, if you if you are good at something, if you know that if you're if you're a good baker and you want to teach people how to bake, you can start an online course and teach, you know, your, your methods of baking. If you are a great public speaker and you want to teach people how to speak in public, that is a way of creating a course. Um, there's just so many different ways. You know, I talk about influencers, rental income. Um, there are different ways, but those are just a few that are, are, are sort of like my favorites. Um, and the reason why those are my favorites, because those are uh, low cost. Those are not things that you need a million dollars. Like you literally uh, can write a book and publish a book for less than one hundred dollars. Right. You can go to Fiverr.com dot com and get someone to create the book cover for you for like ten dollars. And it looks professional. Uh, you can get somebody to edit the book for you. You can get somebody to put the graphics together, like literally can you can launch a book. You can be an author tomorrow with less than a hundred dollars. And so uh, there are some low cost ways of creating residual income. Multiple, uh, you just have to be willing to, to put to put in some work. Mm, excellent advice. So I guess the last question uh, I'll ask you, and it's a, I guess a timely question because it is tax season and many people will be getting income taxes back. So what do you think are some of the things they should be thinking about or strategizing to do with this maybe good chunk of change they'll be receiving soon in the next few weeks? No, absolutely. Um, and that's a great question. I think that it's important, um, again, to to be in the mindset of not working for money, but letting our money work for us. Um, and so I know, 
that around tax season, you know, I do a lot of work in the, in, in the community, uh, you know, around tax season, you, you start to see furniture, you know, furniture trucks, uh, best buy trucks, you know, people buying, uh, you know, things to, to spruce up their, their apartments. Um, and so I would say, don't do it. I, I would say, um, you know, first and foremost, and this is what I would do, honestly, and this might be um, very difficult for people to do, uh, but I would not even think about how I'm going to spend that money. Um, and, and for a couple of reasons, meaning that if you're somebody who uh, has been living paycheck to paycheck um, and you have not been in a space of abundance and you don't know how it feels to be abundant, I would actually remove all plans of spending that money and mm-hmm. decide to just put the money away. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And even if it's for a month, two months, three months, make it an intentional thing to say, I am not even going to spend a dollar from my tax return. I am going to, st- I am going to use this money as my uh, springboard for emergency funds. Right. And so I'm going to put this money away in a savings account and I'm, I'm going to just keep adding to it so that I can reach this number. So maybe your number is $10,000. Maybe your number is $15,000. You know, whatever, whatever it is, use your tax return as a springboard to really just know how it feels to have money. And the reason why that's important, because for me, you know, I, again, I've been a person who uh, has lived paycheck to paycheck, even making a lot of money uh, because I was always spending. Um, and so for me, I was always uh, in spend mode. That becomes a habit to the point where even when I was making a lot of money, I would try, I, I would try to figure out how to spend it. I'm like, man, I don't even, you know, I don't even like my boots are perfect, but I'm going to find somebody who needs these old pair of boots that are perfect and let me buy a new pair just so I can spend it, right? Mm -hmm. Um, But the moment that I started to say, you know what? Uh, I'm good. I'm not spending money on anything. And I started to be intentional um, about saving money, about not trying to figure out how to, how to spend it. Um, I actually started to see, see, you know, see uh, more abundance, right? It became a game for me. It became like, oh, how can I make more money? Or how can I save more money? Or how can I, you know, you know, uh, live, live below my means. Um, And so I would say, I would say the, the, the ideal thing uh, for anybody, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even use that money to pay down debt because I I know a lot of people who think that they're being responsible. And so they take a, a lump sum of money and they pay off debt. The reason why that's the wrong thing to do is because it's about a habit. You need to build new habits, not these sporadic things that you do once in a while because you're not changing your habit. And so if you get a lump sum of money from tax returns and you pay a lump sum into your debt, all that's going to do is eventually you're going to respend that. You're going to you're going to get back into debt and you're going to be right back where you started. I would rather someone you know, say, you know, I'm going to create a debt repayment plan and each month I'm going to pay a little bit off of this debt. So now they, they're learning, you know, h- how to discipline themselves. They're learning how to, you know, use money and, and, and pay bills on time. Um, and so even someone who would think that they're doing the right thing by taking their money and paying off debt, I would say absolutely do not do it. You know, create this new habit. And so the new habit should be to, to save money, hold on to your money um, so that you know how it feels to be abundant. You know how it is. Like it's a normal thing to have $1,000 in your bank account. It's a normal thing to have $2,000 in your bank account. It's a normal thing to have $100,000 in your bank account. It's normal, right? And we need to get to that space. And that's what my ideal advice would be. Uh, for those who it may not be realistic, and, and, re- and for me, reality is, is based on your mindset. Um, and so I'm just saying that for those who may not just be there yet, they might not be ready to say, you know what, I'm not going to spend it away. Um, my second advice would be, if you if you have to spend it, don't spend it on something that's going to depreciate. Spend it on something that will increase your wealth, whether it is uh, start using the money to start a business. If it's using the money to, as a down payment for a home, if it's, you know, using that money to springboard somebody else's business or if it's using that money to, you know, you know, invest in something that's going to give you, you know, dividends or, you know, a return back. Um, it's really about focusing up and, you know, you know, taking that money and, and purchasing income producing assets. And so that would be my second advice. But the first advice is really t- about changing the mindset and creating a new habit. Um, and so I would say to, to try to just hold on to that money, um, and, 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 and learn how it feels to be, to be abundant with cash. 
Mm. That was awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Um, another piece of advice is just wait to file those taxes. Mm. When I used to get a refund, I would I would like wait to the deadline so that I just wasn't even thinking about it. So, um, yeah, I think that's really good. So really appreciate all the awesome oh, really advice uh, that you provided to us. Even the motivation. I feel fired up to just like save yeah, some money to, right now. Like, save, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love Key, right after I read the book, I opened up a CD account. Yes. No lie. Yes. No lie. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, you have a lot of insight. You have a lot of resources. How can our audience reach you? How can they learn more about what you do, get more advice from you? Where can they find you? Absolutely. Um, you can visit me on my website, uh, which is IamAshCash.com. Um, all of my information as far as, you know, access to my podcast, articles, uh, everything that I'm doing is uh, on my website. Uh, but I'm also very active on social media. Um, and so you can follow me, uh, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Uh, my handle is at I am Ash Cash. Uh, I'm very responsive. Um, and so you can definitely connect with me either my website on, on, or on social media. Yes, I, okay. I will probably be reaching out. I want to continue this conversation because, you know, like you said, my goal is we have to close this wealth gap. Um, we have yes. to have to have to. And we can only do it um, if we're communicating and working together. So thank you, Brother Ash. Thank Cash. you so much. And to all our listeners, oh, we appreciate- will. Definitely have all his information uh, on the website as well, where you can get access to him and his social media accounts and his website to definitely learn more. Yeah, my brother, my sister, I appreciate you guys. Thank you for everything that you guys do. Um, and yeah, I, you know, I, I'm just grateful for the platform uh, to be able to connect, you know, with your audience. And, you know, I, I agree a, a hundred percent. You know, it's really about, uh, you know, being being collective and, and moving, you know, in one, you know, one, you know, one sound, one, ba- you know, one band. Um, but, but you know, it's definitely that time to close the wealth gap. And the one thing I want to leave and say um, is that now is the time, right? So, you know, when you think about some of the things that may have been barriers in the past, legal things that were in our way, um, they're starting, you know, it's we're, we're at a space uh, where there really isn't any excuse anymore. And so all we have to do uh, is really recognize the power that we've been given already internally. Like we were born with it. Like no one, no one can give us this power. The power is ours already. Ready? So all we have to do is recognize that power, use that power, and abundance will be ours. So um, it's important that we keep that in mind. Appreciate it, brother. Thank you for those words. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That, that was awesome. <laughs> it was. I like I said it. I was one, I was already fired up after the book. Like I was telling John, I was like, yo, we have to do this. We have to do this. Like I went online with my credit union and just opened up a CD because I was just like, why am I just letting my savings sit here? It's not really mm-hmm. earning anything. Um, and so I just like tried to start like using his book to think about different sources of passive income. And I started to try to figure out like, what what will work for me? Um, because I think the biggest thing is this is a resource and it's a resource that should lead you on a, a rabbit hole to other resources to try to see what is the specific type of passive income opportunity that's good for you. Mm-hmm, so, mm-hmm. yeah, definitely. And that's what everyone should keep in mind, you know, depending on where you are financially, some things will be definitely easier for for some than others, right? Um, trying to create passive income, what that looks like, creating savings and creating things like CDs um, are just going to be different. Everybody's coming from a different starting point. Uh, but I think it's good that we're having this conversation. And like you, after I read the book, you know, I had conversations with my wife and I'm like, okay, how are we about to make some money? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like what are we going to do? We're we looking, you know, thinking, already talking about trying to figure out ways to get property within the next couple of years to begin renting out and getting that passive income coming in and definitely looking at different accounts besides just savings accounts and budgeting. Um, you know, we're just like looking into this thing. And, and there's things to all our listeners, too. You should uh, take note of that. We didn't touch on a bunch of the stuff in the book as well. Uh, we mm-hmm. touched on some of the easy, the basic things. But, you know, he also talks about things like home ownership and gives a lot of great advice for mm-hmm. people who are going to be, you know, 
getting or trying to own homes, especially somebody like me who hasn't done it yet, but a lot of just background information of what I should consider, uh, reducing your credit scores, you know, or, or just credit, credit scores in general and how to fix that up if you're having issues with that. Even spirituality, how he connects that with finances too in the book, I thought was also fascinating. So there's a lot more in the book that we didn't get a chance to speak about. So this is why you all should go out and, and definitely read it some more, um, cause you will learn a lot for sure. Yeah, and it's available electronically for four forty four, which is so cool. Four dollars and forty four cents on Amazon. <laughs> I have it on my Kindle, and it's also available um, in paperback. One of the things that you uh, that I really appreciated um, around his uh, home ownership discussion was how he kind of broke down the difference between like the fixed and the variable rate because Mm -hmm. during the housing bubble and the housing crisis that disproportionately impacted black and Latinos. Yep. One of the biggest issues is that so many of us had variable rate mortgages. And when the interest rate skyrocketed, we could no longer afford the payments. And right now, uh, interest rates are at historic lows and it's just kind of like, don't don't get caught up in what he says, like you're chasing the American dream, but chasing it in a way that is not sustainable. So, yes, there's a lot of good advice. One resource that I wanted to mention, because it's like, you know, John and I, we are transitioning. We are not buying any type of real estate, like at least for the next two or three years, because we're just like in flux. Um, but one thing I found in my rabbit hole about real estate was this. Um, and this is not a paid endorsement. And I have not invested any money yet. <laughs> Because I am going to read more before I put my money anywhere. But one thing I found is this uh, this uh, business or company called Fundrise, where you can invest in commercial real estate opportunities. You can choose uh, kind of based on the project and um you know, based on like historical trends, they have like really good returns on investment. So like you might not have a million dollars to spend, but maybe you have five hundred dollars because I think you can get started as low as either five hundred or a thousand dollars. But that's a way to get into real estate, you know, before maybe you're able to you know, make your big purchase. So there are lots of opportunities out there. You just need to know what are the different avenues and then you can start figuring things out. Again, that's not an endorsement. Please read <laughs> before you invest in anything. Just like I'm going to read before I invest in anything. <laughs> um, no, that's a good point because um, it's just, even when you're talking about the housing and the variable interest rates and when the housing market crashed, people don't understand that when they were coming up with the, when that, you know, these kind of special mortgages and loans, you know, they packaged it so that people of color in these particular communities would be able to afford um, housing. Right. And so that they, mm-hmm. the, the idea was that, oh, it would raise uh, property value and the people would get money back and et cetera, et cetera. And they packaged it, politicians and, and everyone packaged it for poor communities of color. And then with the intent to use those kind of uh, derivatives, et cetera, passing them around on the market and changing the interest rate where people couldn't afford their homes and were defaulting and then had to leave, which actually re- did the complete opposite and reduced, you know, overall property value in these communities and left people in an immense amount of debt, right? Um, and financial mm-hmm. crises. But this is not the first time we've seen this. We've seen this also when they were developing public housing units in Chicago as well. And, you know, they, again, package it for low income communities of color. And when they first did it, the public housing units were very nice. They had gardens, they had parks, they had resources. And then once they got everybody in there, they pulled the resources, right? And then now they're not upkeeping the plumbing. They're not upkeeping the landscape. They removed all kind of facilities facilities and people managing the facilities. And this is what we have today. Right. And even contemporary times. Right. They're doing this with um, higher education and these predatory loans where they're trying to they have these predatory colleges where they will say, okay, um, hey, again, packaging this towards poor communities of color have these colleges that don't have anything. Right. But they will say, okay, come here. We'll let you in no matter what. Just get this loan. And they give you the loan and then they don't have the the proper resources, et cetera, to keep you people drop out. But the college doesn't care because they already got the money from the loan. If you drop out and then you're no longer going to college, you're also paying uh, these loans with high interest rates. And it's a system, again, how they're preying on the poor black communities and they're patching. They're always going to package it in a really nice, fancy way that's 
going to look real attractive, either low interest rates in the beginning or saying, hey, you can get this, whatever product you're selling, whether it be education, whether it be housing, etc. You can get it really easily. And then once they get us, then they remove everything. And then uh, we see that we get surprised and then we get hurt in these situations financially. So we really have to pay attention to what they're giving to us and not just take it immediately. Mm-hmm. Don't be buying no fool's gold, honey. Don't don't do it. Everything that glitters is not gold. And like kind of on especially that education thing, I have seen a lot of like the one thing you cannot say about my people is that we are not hungry to achieve and and achieve the American dream, get education or get whatever. It's just realizing that everything that comes easy is is not necessarily the best thing. And I'm just going to say that about especially those for profit colleges and with Devos in office and she's Mm -hmm. profiting from them. You you won't get reprieve from the government if, you know, those the schools close down and, and you still have those loans. So don't fall for it, people. Another point uh, that he talked about is buying black, but also buying from people who support black. And I am 100 percent down with that. One resource that we're going to put on the website, um, because he like I said, he had all the information in his book. He had like an entire list of like websites and apps that you can use to find black owned businesses so we're gonna mm-hmm. list all those like maggie's list we buy black um let's uh buy black 365 black trade lines and so we're, we're gonna list those resources on the website so that you can choose how you spend your dollars and let, let's recycle this a little bit before we like you know take it out of the community you know yeah. You know, this is a question, uh, you know, a question I always pose to my guys in Newark when I have group and, um, you know, I always ask them, like, in order to succeed, we have to be able to and consciously spend money on our own folk in our own communities. And a lot of times what we'll see is that, you know, if you have a young brother on the street or in the corner, yo, trying to be in the fashion, he's making really nice scarves. But then you have, you know, you go to the store or the mall and there's a Louis scarf, right? Most of the time, people are going to take that dollar and give it to this Louis Vuitton, right? Who is mm-hmm. not putting any money back in their community, who probably doesn't even care about their community. Uh, but because probably of the name attached to it, they want to wear their stuff low key. Wanna, Exactly. Exactly. Right. And so but you can also give that money and to the to the young brother on the corner who's trying to you know start his own business. And that's going to be reinvested back in your community. If he gets bigger, he creates jobs, he creates a business, he hires people from the community. Those tax dollars come back to the community. It creates better schools, better parks, all that kind of stuff. And it's really just about giving back to ourselves. And it's not a secret because we see how these other communities do it. I mean, he talked about in the book how, um, you know, I'm not going to get into all the details. I want you to read it, but how blacks, we spend our money, we give our money to other communities and other communities keep their money in-house, right? And we see this in the Jewish community. We see this in the Asian community, et cetera. And we just don't do that. And that's not, it's not a secret. We see how the blueprint, how it works for them. So now if we want to have our own and, and excel financially as a community. That's the first step, right? putting black first. Everybody else puts their people first. So there's nothing wrong with putting black people first when it comes to finances, business, education, whatever it is, we go to our our people first and then we make it happen. You know what I wanted to ask you, because it, it came up in the book, um, mm-hmm. especially with like keeping money in a com- uh, community and stuff like this. He mentioned lending clubs. W- would you ever participate in a lending club? Where we let it was- borrow like 250 <laughs> where we, where we put, have people, uh, the lending club, if I remember correctly, was where we, uh, people have like a pool of money and they use it for certain things, right? In the community. Uh, yeah. So it's kind of like maybe everybody puts in 250 and it's, I think at a certain point, you know, that's like lend it out to, you know, one person in the club. I, I have to, I have to reread it again, but yeah. Yeah, it's like creating this pool of money that where people don't have to go to like banks or other institutions to if they need it, you know, the community already has it. And there's certain stipulations that people put into it, like a community fund. And I thought that was pretty cool. I think that's something that can be um, discussed a little bit more. I think it can be possible, but you also got to be careful with that, too, because you know how mm-hmm. people are with they with their money and, and putting it oh, in a pot. Oh, child. I was <laughs> so like- if, I, if I were to do it, I would only put in money that I really would not care or look 
to be getting back in any way. You know, it's just like it's a it's an expense for the community. It is however we use it, we use it. But you know, it can be. Tricky. I was just like, it would be have to be some people that I really trust, really trust with my money. But I do yeah. like the idea behind it. I like the idea yeah. behind it. Yeah, and then, and then maybe there can be more formal ways of making something like that happen, right? Um, it doesn't have to be such an informal process, but it can happen in, in a more concrete, structured way where it makes people a little bit more comfortable um, and investing back in the communities. But I mean, overall, I think this was a great conversation and and uh, we want you all to pay attention to a lot of the gems he dropped. Definitely pick up the book. Mm-hmm. All you need is $4.44, you know, yes. Yes. <laughs> at bare minimum. I would say it was definitely worth it. And it's not just like blowing smoke up your behind. No, like I seriously took some things from it and I immediately like put some of them into action. Like I read a lot, um, all all types of financial things all the time. And I got something from the book that I hadn't even, you know, thought of before, especially around the passive income thing. Um, So I'm trying to put that into motion now. So it it was definitely worth the read. Uh, Definitely worth that 444. Definitely worth 444. So, um, you know, everybody pay attention to your finances. I know y'all getting them tax dollars back and, you know, save it, figure out ways that it can make you more money. Just don't stop there. Don't say, oh, I'm getting, you know, $2,000 back now. What can I do with this? No, see how you can use this to make sure you get $6,000 back in the long run. Right. Um, I think that's the key, not just about spending, but also about how we can get multiple streams of revenue coming in and not just be relying on one. And then we all can be happy. And be better down the line, you know? Agreed. But, uh, other than that, um, as always, we appreciate you all listening. Continue to give us feedback. Continue to rate and review us on the podcast, on iTunes and everything else. We're on YouTube, etc. Email us at uh, bhdpodcast at gmail.com. Follow us on social media at bhdpodcast is the social media handle. Um, and again, give us questions. Give us feedback. We want to do many episodes where we're responding to all your questions and feedback and and trying to make sure maybe give more detailed responses, maybe clarify some things that may have been miscommunicated. Mm-hmm. Whatever it is, we appreciate your feedback. We appreciate you listening. Spread the word. Just don't take this listen these listenings and, and gems for yourself. Pass them to friends. Pass from the family um, because you know the more people know the more we are educated the better we'll be in the long run yes pass the love around pass it around all right (laughs) Um, other than that continue to be the oppressor's worst fear and until next time if you're interested in continuing this and other conversations, visit our website, blackandhollydangerous.com to subscribe to our email list, suggest topics and participate in our discussion forums. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook at BHD Podcast. And please don't forget to subscribe and rate our podcast on your favorite platform. And as always, continue to be the oppressor's worst fear.